Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you, Say, Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Jeremiah chapter 50. We're going to pick it up here in a moment in verse 33. God is kind of coming down on Babylon. But in the future sense, I want you to remember, Babel is confusion. And there is much confusion in the world, and that's what God wants to dispel. How do you get rid of confusion? You get rid of it with truth. You don't give a little bit of truth and part truth. You give full, pure truth. And that will dispel confusion whereby people can understand. Naturally, these things that happened historically let us know exactly how it's going to be in the end. So having said that, let's get right back into it as Father begins to talk about the downfall of Babylon. We'll pick it up in chapter 50, verse 33, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The children of Israel and the children of Judah were oppressed together, though they were separate, separate houses, and all that took them captives held them fast and refused to let them go. Uh, this, is, this is true to the extent uh, it would seem that the true house of Israel, that they like to be confused, and after having been taken captive by the Assyrian, they never really, most of them knew who they were after that. Verse 34, their Redeemer is strong. Praise God for that. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. He will do away with that confusion. Do you know how he does that, basically? He does that by having, when, when the, fall, the king of Babylon, the false one, which is to say the Antichrist, when his election, as it's written in Mark 13, are delivered up before him, the words that come from their mouth, spoken by the Holy Spirit, is, is the truth that Luke 21 declares that not even the gainsayers can come against it. That is the truth that will put out of uh, place uh, deception and uh, the deceit that misleads the world. Certainly God's election, have, they've got work to do. And many of them have known there was more to God's word when they were a child than they were being taught. Verse 35. A sword is upon the Chaldeans, saith the Lord, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, and upon his princes, and upon his wise men. And naturally, that sword is what? Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 is the tongue of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's sharp, a sharp sword that cuts both ways, a double-edged sword. That's what the truth is, and that's what puts them down. A lie cannot stand in front of the truth. It just does not happen. 36, a sword is upon the liars, and they shall dote. That means they're, they're going to look like a bunch of fools. A sword is upon her mighty men, and they shall be dismayed. Uh, the inhabitants of Babylon, those that live in confusion, will be shocked. <clears throat> it is strange, but even today, when the truth is taught, that you're not going to fly away somewhere. You're going to make a stand against the false one as it's written in God's word. <clears throat> not the deception of the so-called one verse revolving, revolving raw, revs that would deceive and lead, mislead people into thinking, you don't have to understand God's word. You're going to be gone. God has work for his election. They're his hammer. They're his army, along with the one he brings with him. And certainly... There's work to be done, and it's not something we run from. We stand against the fiery darts of Satan. That's what the gospel armor is all about. Verse 37, a sword is upon their horses and upon their chariots and upon all the mingled 
that's the rabble that's with them, gathered up, people that are in the midst of her, of confusion, and they shall become as women. A sword is upon her treasures, and they shall be robbed. In other words, uh, Mystery Babylon, how precious she is, and all her glory. Uh, they, they become as women, why? Um, because, unfortunately, that is how Sister Babylon is described, as a female. And certainly, then, but it, she consists of both male and female that are deceived. And what are they writing as it is written in Revelation chapter 17? The one world political system has got them all tied up in knots, deceiving them, leading them, holding them with false religion. Verse 38, a drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up. For it is the land of graven images, and they are mad. They love upon their idols. They, they can hardly get over it. Why is there a drought there? Well, what's the living water? The living water is the word of Christ. The living water is the word of truth. Drawn from that well, if you partake of it, you never thirst again. In other words, within all of the confusion, you're not going to find any truth. It dries up. It's gone. There is no living water there. Verse 39, Therefore the wild beast of the desert with the wild beast of the island shall dwell there, and the owl shall dwell therein, and it shall be no more inhabited forever. Neither shall it be dwelt, it dealt, it dwelt in from generation to generation. But why? Because we go, when, when Christ returns at the second advent, where, where do, what happens? King of kings and Lord of lords. There is no other nation. And, and actually, we all move into that spiritual dimension because we go into spiritual bodies through the Lord's day. And as we know it today, it will not be inhabited. There will not be confusion in that um, dimension ever again. Why? Because we will never be back in the, this particular dimension again. Through the Lord's day, we are in spiritual bodies. Therefore, you have full recall, full memory, and everyone has an opportunity and perfect help to make his or her mind up whether they're going to love God or Satan. Your choice. And so it is. That is for the people that did not have an opportunity and uh, in this particular dispensation of time. Many might say, well, there's a church on every corner, but what's taught there? Verse 40. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Well, how, how did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Did he have an army? No. Did he do it himself? Yes. God doesn't need our help in destroying the enemy. It is true that your witness and testimony with the Holy Spirit speaking through you will, will um, announce and instigate the command of the fall of that great city, that great Babylon. And so it is that uh, God uses his election. What a time to live and what a time to serve the living God. Uh, verse 41, Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the, the uh, coast of the earth. Uh, 42, They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses, every one put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. Now, who, who would that be? The king of Babylon, of course. Here it was Nebuchadnezzar. Who is this that's coming? It's the Medes and the Persians, which is Cyrus, one born of woman, forenamed years before he was ever born by God himself, one of the only people in God's word that God himself named, because he would use Cyrus to reestablish, the same as he uses his election. He elected Cyrus. 
he elected his election of the end times as well. I chose you before the foundations of the earth, as it is written in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. What an army in the future is sin, spiritual. 43, the king of Babylon hath heard the report of them, and his hands waxed feeble. Anguish took hold of him, and pains as of a woman in travail. That's the birth of a new age. 44, behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan unto the habitation of the strong, but I will make them suddenly run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? Question, for who is like me? Question, and who will appoint me the time? Question. And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? Now, it, you should know who this is, because if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Who is like the Father? The Son is. Why? Because he's Emmanuel, God with us. And Christ shall be appointed over as what? Returning on a white horse himself. Not to, not to be born a babe and crucified but returning as a warrior, king of kings and lord of lords with a rod of iron. Rule and reign, not to be crucified. Verse 45. Therefore hear ye the counsel of the Lord. You want to listen? That he hath taken against Babylon and his purpose, that uh, his purposes, that he hath proposed his purpose against the land of the Chaldeans. That's all five dialects of them. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with them. You know, many people worry about being delivered up before the false Messiah. You don't have to. They have, they have no power against you when you're delivered up. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is in you, with you, and through you. God himself, our Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer, takes over. Verse 46. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved. It quakes. And the cry is heard among the nations. And so it is. She has fallen. She has fallen. Confusion has fallen. You know, the greatest shock comes when confusion falls in the future is sent. And many people that consider themselves to be good Christians, when they wake up and see the real truth that they've been worshiping the false one, went to church all their lives, basically, loving Jesus, but then to not be taught that the false Christ comes first and they hop in the sack with him. They worship him, go to church to him. And then to find out when he falls that um, those that warned long before that became God's election, that actually witnessed against, they wake up and see the true Christ returning and how ashamed they will be. As it's written in Revelation chapter 9, many pray for the mountains to fall them. They're too ashamed to face the living God. Chapter 51, verse 1, continuing. There is a cryptogram in this particular verse. It's, it's important because God wants you to know who it is that rises against him. Listen carefully. I will explain as we go. Verse 1, Thus saith the Lord. This is the Lord's word. Behold, or you look here carefully, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me. That's your cryptogram. Rise up against me, a destroying wind. I will do it. Now, the thing is, is this cryptogram is like the one we had prior, where the last letter of the alphabet becomes the first, and so on and so forth. And Leb Kamai, Leb, Leb, Leb Kamai is the word. Um, who is it? those that come against God in confusion and otherwise. And, and naturally, well, who is it? Well, he lets you know because the, the cryptogram makes it read Kazdim, which is to say 
being converted, the Chaldeans. Well, who are the Chaldeans? The citizens of Babylon. Those that are wrapped up in her, with her. Well, is it a nation? No, it's confusion on the whole world. And naturally, God lets us know which nation she roosts in permanently, that is to say, primarily, and where we have our truths that come forth from prophecy, those we know and we look forward to. But God lets you know here, my enemy is really the citizens, that, that's the Chaldeans are the citizens of Babylon. It is the citizens themselves that individually against what? Against God. And, and know and understand this. If you're deceived and you go with the false Christ, you're going against God. You're one of those in the Babylonian confusion, Babel, that go against the living God and maybe even lead some of your own family with you. Therefore, God says, I'm against them. So there's a great deal in that cryptogram for the scholar that wants to take the time to look who it is that truly God considers comes against him. Verse 2 to continue. And will send unto Babylon fanners. They shall fan her. Do you know what that is? That's harvesting. That's winnowing. And shall empty her land, for in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. God's election will not give pace. God's election with the Holy Spirit speaking through them, you're not to even premeditate what you'll say. He'll do the talking. They haven't got a prayer. Verse 3. Against him they bend, that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow. And against him that lifteth himself up in the brigadine, that's his armor, and spare ye not her young men, and destroy ye utterly all her hosts. You absolutely take that state of confusion, of lies, of deception, and you run it off the face of the earth with truth. Verse 4. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans. And here he brings the word out, Chaldeans, so you know who he's talking about. And they that are thrust uh, through in her streets, uh, they're wounded right there. Why? Wounded and the grief is, will be great when people realize they've worshipped the false Christ. You know, most of our people are good people. But without teachers, they're in a heap of hurt. Without understanding God's word, you can be in a heap of hurt. When this moment comes, the time of God's visitation, verse 5, For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, God hadn't forgot him, of the Lord of hosts, though, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. In other words, both the house of Israel, which most of the Christian nations make up, those ten lo so-called lost tribes, God hasn't lost anyone. And the house of Judah, that's why they're always mentioned separate here. Verse 6, flee out of the midst of Babylon. You come out of confusion. Well, how do I come out of confusion? By learning truth and deliver every man his soul. You want, you want salvation? This is the way you find it. Be not cut off in her iniquity, her sin. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. And that day is coming. You know, it is so easy to get wrapped up in the one world political system with the false leader coming very soon, performing miracles in the sight of men, women, children on this earth. It's going to happen. Verse 7, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Do not read over that. He's in whose hand? The Lord's hand. That made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Now, uh, this is what confusion does to the nations. 
Do, have you ever, do, do, you, do you not know about Revelation chapter 17, verse 4? Remember it said, she's a cup in the Lord's hand, and the cup he's going to pour out. Okay. Yet double her cup to her measure. In Re I, I'm going to read the fourth verse of Revelation chapter 17 to you. Listen carefully in regards to the verse I just covered. And the woman, this is Sister Babylon, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Do you realize that's royalty? And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And a golden cup in her hand full of abominations uh, and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and an abomination of the earth. Why? They're worshiping Satan, thinking he's Christ. As many times as God warned that this would come to pass, people linger on and sleep on sweet Charlotte and do not come to the truth in God's word to know and recognize the one world political system and the false leader very soon on the scene who will mislead many. No, they are drunken with the dregs of false teaching. And uh, it's, it's so sad in a way to hear someone tell a congregation, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation, God's word. Listen to me. And you'll be listening to the false one very soon because you'll be listening to a false one that would make that statement. The word revelation means to unveil and to make known. A fool knows if a book is titled to make known, you should know it. And it's quite simple that a child can understand it if you let the word speak rather than man's traditions. Returning to chapter 51, verse 8. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. She's gone. Howl for her, take balm for her pain, if so be she may be healed. She can't be. She suffers a grievous wound. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go every one into his own country, for her judgment reacheth unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies, and so it is, and so it, do you know? Do you know where this is written in the Minor Prophets that you can really see a picture of it? Zechariah chapter five, where it says, "Make a great sign, and you put her in a basket, the old heifer, and you take her up in that basket, an unclean bird, put a lid on it, and take her up between heaven and earth." And so it is. God warns over and over about this deception that comes upon the people of this world. They have a father that created their very being and created an earth if it's tended properly that will really care for you. And then at the same time, they like to fall into playing church. If you're not careful, is God's word taught there? That's chapter by chapter, verse by verse, whereby you know Babylon where you can recognize her. Confusion, in other words. Verse 10, the Lord has brought forth our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. Not Satan's, not some other man's work, but God's work, God's own being. Verse 11, make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up a spirit of the kings of the Medes. This would be Cyrus' name. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. And it shall come to pass. Again, I'm going to say, God forenamed and surnamed Cyrus. He chose him before he was ever born. Just as he chose his election of the end times from the first earth age before they were born into the flesh, which they filled that role of allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them to, to nail confusion and to drive it asunder. 
again, I want to drop back to where it, it says Babylon is a cup in God's hand. In other words, God allows it, but he will put a stop to it. Verse 12, set up a standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong and set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushes, for the Lord hath devised and done that which he spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. The truth will prevail. The truth always does prevail. It is man's um, uh, traditions that fall by the wayside in the trash, in the abomination of the teachings of Babel. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, thine end is come, and the measure of thy covetousness. Uh, I mean, you've hidden away all the very truths and covered them over with a whitewash of false religion. It's all going to wash away with the rains of the latter time when truth uh, uh, washes it from that wall. 14. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, no greater can be sworn by, saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as with caterpillars, that's locusts, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. This is going to show you that just as the enemy would bring the swarm against the house of Israel and the house of Judah, God also, in like ways, is putting together a swarm of honest people that will swarm the enemy. He had made the earth by his power. God spoke, there it is. Nothing became everything. He hath established the world by his wisdom. He hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. I can never read this without thinking of poor old Job, you know? And, and old Job put on probation. As a matter of fact, that's what it means. 38 chapters of listening to a bunch of ratchet jaws, traditions of men. They weren't even Israelites, his good friends. They knew nothing. And finally, in the 38th chapter, God says, Job, for heaven's sakes, Get up off the ground. Stand up and act like a man. Why are you listening to these knuckleheads? My word. He said, these that know not what they speak of. He said, I I'm the one that created the whole earth. Why don't you listen to me? It is my wisdom that formed it. Why don't you listen to me? And uh, I even created you, Job. That is to say, the sons of the stars of heaven, the sons of God. I made all your souls. Why don't you listen to me instead of men, traditions? So you can't help but think of that when you read that particular verse. God's trying to reason with man. Don't listen to traditions. Listen to me. 16. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Uh, and, um, and so it is that our Father uh, is in control. He created nature as it is. But always remember, after the Catabel, the earth lost all of its innocence as far as from the north to the south pole, it was hab habitable. I mean, Buttercups grew up to where tundra is now in Alaska. Why? Because of the firmament shielded the earth and made every inch of it livable. What a beautiful time it was in that first earth age. And yet after the catabo, it opened the heavens and the sun and the jet streams and the storms. Makes it a little different situation because it is a stormy time. 17, every man is brutish by his knowledge. Understand, his own knowledge, not God's knowledge. Brutish means just a little bit stupid, if you want to know the truth of it. Every founder is confounded. 
by the graven image, for his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. You make up a false religion, and that's all you've got. Why is there no life in it? Because God's not in it, and God won't bless it. And you're, you're in a heap of hurt when you play church with men's traditions rather than the Word of God. 18, they are vanity, the work of errors in the time of their visitation, and they shall perish. You know, only the good remains. When ultimately when all is through. 19, the portion of Jacob, and that's the natural, all 12 tribes, okay, is not like them. For he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name, Yahweh, our Heavenly Father. That is his name. And he created it all. It is his to do with as he chooses. And when he allows, man wants to name his own king, his own political systems. Oh, can man mess things up? And then it comes to pass, as it's written in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4, I believe it is, your leaders in the end are going to be like children. They're going to have children's minds, the way they lead you into nothingness. So, what a mess man can get himself into without putting God in charge uh, to know and to understand and to follow his advice. Verse 20. Thou art my battle axe uh, and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Well, what is he talking about here? This is very important to you, or it should be, because you're included. Is he talking about? He's talking about Cyrus here. Okay. Well, why does Cyrus have to do with it? God foreknamed him long before he ever came into being, just as he foreknamed his election in the end times. And what he's saying is, in the future sense, I'm going to use you. When you're delivered up, you are my battle axe. You get it done. And then again, I'll repeat, as I said earlier, in this lecture in Luke 21, it states that even the gainsayers are, are convinced by what you say, because it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit speaking through you, God speaking through you. How precious it is to have a part in his ministry in these end times, in his, in, in, um, his living water that gives a breath of fresh air and life to a population that is being willy woggy from one side to the other with untruths and false leading and false guidance, bad government, and there it goes. There's better things ahead when you stand for what is right. Don't ever let anyone convince you other than that. You are that battle ax. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you've got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, uh, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. You don't need to. God does. But you do have the right to spiritually discern truth from fiction. And that is your prerogative to do that. God expects you to. 
Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Got a prayer request now, and you don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You're his child. He created your very being, and he owns you. You don't get around to giving yourself to God. According to Ezekiel 18.4, all souls belong to God, period. They're his to do with as he chooses. So if you're pleasing to him, he promises blessings. Don't forget to claim that. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Rick from New Hampshire. Why did James write a letter to the 12 tribes of the dispersion in the house of Judah? If the house of Judah returned to Jerusalem from the Babylonian captivity and weren't scattered, James 1.1, 1, 1, didn't G James mean that most of the 12 tribes were still scattered, including the house of Judah? That's why he said it. And, and as, if you've ever studied the book of Ezra with me, Ezra, you know that most of the people that returned to Jerusalem were not of the house of Judah, but they were uh, nef um, Nephinim, that is to say, given to service. They were uh, people that had been drafted, foreigners drafted in into doing liturgical duties. Uh, most of the names were not of the tribe of Judah. So naturally, very few of Judah returned uh, at that particular time. Ray from California, can you give me a scripture in the Bible or reference a Hebrew Greek dictionary, a Bible dictionary, a Bible concordance, or a commentary that shows that the word Elohim means God's children? What? Don't you have a Strong's concordance? Uh, you know, all, all you have to do is go to the word 430. It is plural of 433. Let, let me say that again in case you didn't catch it. Go to the Hebrew dictionary. The word 430 is Elohim. It comes from 433, which is singular, but 430 is plural. And, and it, means, um, it means God and the angels. Okay? It means God and his children. So, also, can you give me scripture that says angels have a soul? Psalms 104.4, haven't you ever read it? Do you think, you really think that Michael doesn't have a soul? He's the head, being head of Israel, the head angel? That you think he doesn't have a soul? A soul is, in the Hebrew tongue, is yourself. It's your being. Okay? Okay, I hope that helps you. Uh, let's see here. We've got Jackie from Missouri. I was always taught that the 144,000 were Jews from the 12 tribes. Would you comment on this? Do, do, you, do you understand how awkward what you just, how you ask that? How many tribes, how many in the tribes were, how many tribes did Judah have? One. Those of the tribe of Judah are Eudas, that's to say Jews. All the rest are different tribes of Israel, Benjamites and so on and so forth. Paul happened to be a Benjamite. Romans chapter 1, uh, Romans chapter 11 verse 1 documents that. So only one of the 12 tribes were of the house of Judah. All the rest were of the house of Israel. Okay. Naturally, we have the Levitical priesthood that is one of those tribes, and each tribe had its own portion divided up. That meant the preachers, okay? Uh, Mark from Kansas. First, my family and I would like to thank you and the whole Shepherd's Chapel staff, the hard work. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. We've been studying the Bible with you since 1986, but as you say, we are still learning. So I have a couple of questions. My first question is, the four winds in Jeremiah 49.36, are they the same four winds as in Revelation 7.3.1? Yes. My second question is, are the four destroying angels on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of Revelation 7.3? No, they are not. Those are not destroying angels. 
There are God's angels that consummate the end of the age, and it hurts the wicked. But they are not destroying or known for destruction, but doing God's work, okay? Uh, are they not the same four destroying angels bound in the great river Euphrates? Right? Absolutely not. The ones in the Euphrates are bound, meaning they're prisoners. They're part of those that fall, that fell, Nephilim, okay? Anytime uh, you can find the four winds mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 37, you can find the four winds mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. It has to do with the, with the, the, uh, the spirit that moves in all from every quadrant of the earth into one central point that brings about the end. That's what, that's what it signifies. But the four bound angels have nothing to do with their operation. Jason from Georgia. In John 15, is, is John 15, 4 a contradiction of 2 Corinthians 5, 8? The reason I ask is because at John 15, 4, it reads that to gain eternal life, one must abide in Jesus, while in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, one must um, ascend from the body to be present with the Lord. Uh, albeit in Jesus, as it's used in John, means to do works that glorify God. Well, I, I, think, I think you are not understanding what being with Jesus means in this dispensation of time. And you can find out in Luke chapter 16. They all, sinners and saints, go to paradise. However, as you read in Luke 16, paradise is divided. The bad guys go on this side, the left, and the good guys go on the right side. Okay, that's where Christ and the angels are. The lefties, they're just out. Okay, but that means they didn't make it. And uh, what they must do, and that's why the old rich man was just, I mean, he was in hell spiritually, not literally. Because he couldn't buy his way out? What? But, well, you mean to tell me that bad people go to paradise? Who do you think the judge is? Well, God is, of course. Everybody knows that. Well, sure. But who do you think God is? He's in paradise. You've got to go there to be judged. So the good, the bad, and the ugly all go to paradise, but some of them don't stay there. Okay? I think that will help you understand that. Uh, my name is Sabrina, and I live in Texas. I've studied okay with you, but, but I have a question. When we are delivered up before the synagogues of Satan, will we still be in our earthly bodies? I'm guessing from Mark 13 that we will, and you got it right, you absolutely will be. But you still don't have anything to worry about. God protects his own. It, it is written in Luke 21, which I'm quoting that quite a bit in this lecture. They can't harm a hair on your head. Why? He's playing Jesus. He, he's the false Christ, but he's got to, if he's going to deceive anybody, he's got to act like Christ. So he doesn't go around butchering people. And when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, the, the scales begin to fall off the eyes of people around the world. You're God's hammer. Caroline from California. So, am I correct in... You answered a question this morning as to who are those who rebel and followed Satan in the first earth age. Someone asked if these are us, and we're here now for a second chance. I think you answered yes. Am I correct? No, you're not correct. God, everyone, God is not a respecter of persons. All his children are going to pass through the flesh, okay? Every last one of them, except the archangels. They do not. But God chose his election, that's to say those that did right, to be his elect in the end times to stand against Satan. Why? Well, he chose them because he knows that in the first earth age, that they stood against Satan, would not bow to him, fought him tooth and nail, and God knows he can trust him to do it again. 
That's why he calls them his election. It isn't that they're the prettiest, they're the best, or anything else. It's just that they can cut it. They can get it done. And he can trust them to do that. That's why he chose them as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, before the foundations of the earth. It's why he wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, you don't even know what to pray for as a saint. Set aside one elect. But I know, and I intercede in your life when I want to move you somewhere to get to be my hammer, to get work done. Therefore, I foreordained you that before the foundations of the world. And so it is. God has his election, but they certainly weren't the bad ones. They're probably what you heard me say. I feel the third that followed Lucifer were born in the generation in which Lucifer will return again as Antichrist. That's their, their privilege of saying, what are you going to do this time? And, and I, as, as a, a senior citizen, I have seen people change. When that third came here, things began to change. And um, what a difference. But what a difference a day can even make, but certainly a generation. But everyone... God is not a respecter of persons. Everybody that loves him and is converted to him will find eternal life. Francis from Arizona. In 2006, I loaned my daughter and her husband $130,000 also to buy a house since then. Her husband started reading and teaching the Bible. He told her that the Bible says that they don't have to pay me back, my, my money back. Is this true? Where in the Bible does it state that? It doesn't. He's lying to you. Okay? He's really, he's for his own convenience. A man that won't pay his debt to his family is worse than an infidel. That's, uh, you'll find that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. A man that does his family that way will not take care of them is worse than an infidel. And he's teaching the Bible? I hope somebody gets a break. Uh, okay, don't, don't worry, God's in control, he knows, okay, and um, you have ways of retrieving that. You shouldn't sue a Christian, but you can sue an infidel, okay, but I'm not giving you any uh, advice, that's your choice. Barbara from New Jersey, I have a question, what is the urinum thernum, that was back again when when um, in a certain way to have communicate with God. In Hebrews 6, 2, and 4, Paul, is Paul talking about when we sin and repent, or is it a person who is saved and when then willingly turns from the Father and turns to Satan in Hebrews 6, 2, 4? Well, what, what, what it means is, and what he's saying, if, if you say you've got to be saved again, who does the saving? Christ does. So, if, if your salvation is a failure, you're saying Christ failed. And you're like re-crucifying him all over again. God doesn't like that. That's what it's talking about. Well, then what in the world do you do? All you do is repent. It's that simple. Your salvation is there. But you can slip so far away from it, you can go to hell. So, that, therefore, you repent and come back into good standing, don't call Christ a failure. When he saves you, the salvation is there, but you can sure drift away from it. You're the failure, not Christ, when that happens. Sharon from Florida, I'm a black Christian woman. Will you please explain to me why it's always implied that the blacks carry the curse of Cain? Where did this come from, and what what did we as a race of people do to deserve this curse? The Lord created all races and said it is good. Is there anywhere in his word that says we are cursed? They're absolutely not. Okay. And to say that uh, you have the curse of Cain is a lie. In, in the first place, um, um, Cain is not of black ethnicity. His offspring are not of black ethnicity unless they mixed, but um, that, that is just simply a lie. And as you know, God created all the races, including the black race, on the sixth day, 
And he looked, and as you state, you're a good scholar. He says, it's good. That, that's the way I want you, and that's the way I love you. But um, that's a man's lie, because uh, the curse of Cain is on the Kenites, and they are not a black race. Carol from Michigan, is it okay to attend a church to worship our Father and have fellowship only even though we know the church teaches the rapture theory? It is the only church near us that reads from the King James Version. If not, please tell me where the scripture is that documents that I do not, that I do not want to anger the Father. God kind of, I never tell anybody where they should go to church because I believe God leads his children like you where he wants them. There may be something there he's got you to do. I, I, I'm not the judge of that. God is. The only reason you shouldn't, would you would find if you had a conviction, you, which I think you're probably toying with that, you should read the second epistle of John. Um, I'll repeat. The second epistle of John. That is the three short books, epistles of John in the New Testament. Not St. John, but the second epistle of John. There's only one chapter. Lillian from North Carolina. What happens to a person that is always doing wrong? Can they go to heaven? You know, Jesus was asked this question once about sinners, and he said, how many times can a person repent? He said, four hundred seven times 70. 490 times if you're genuinely repenting. They're just, nobody is, when we're in the flesh, we have many temptations. Things always pull in this way and that way. You can even sin against your own flesh by the way you eat, even. It's real easy to fall short. And that's why God, and God knows us. He knows we're not perfect. And, and, and we know we're not perfect. And that's why the greatest gift for Christianity from Christ is forgiveness but always forgive yourself I kind of have a little feeling I sense somebody's not forgiving themselves in this because when you forgive yourself and repent you got a whole clean new sheet you've got to start all over fresh in the Lord that's the beauty of Christianity don't ever ever let anyone take that away from you um, unfortunately, some churches, I'll just say another word about this, some churches hold people by fear. Okay. You're going to go to hell if you do this, and you're going to go to hell if you do that. God doesn't wake up every morning and say, I wonder who I can zap today. God loves his children, and he wants his children to love him. Don't ever let anyone hold you by fear or take repentance away from you. That's a gift from God. Uh, Jeff from Kentucky, why did God need someone to protect the mercy seat? Well, it's really quite simple. God created his beings, his children, and he gave them free will to love him. That's what he wants mainly is their love. Okay, He lets you know that. But love must be given freely and you must have free will for that love to come from you to him. He cannot order love and have it real. You cannot pay for love and have it real. And you cannot force someone to love you. Okay. It's got to come from within, freely and open. And when he created that many souls, billions of them in the beginning, some of them are going to go bad. Okay. And he knew that, having free will. And that's why we've gone through this process of three earth ages. We're in the second one now. Because he gave free will, Satan worked himself up, as it's written in Ezekiel 28, all the way to the top, protecting cherub. And then pride took him over, and he wanted to be savior. And here we go again. That's what started the whole thing. Uh, Chuck from Nebraska, Pastor Murray, your opinion is needed. In regards to the time shortened stated in Matthew 24, 22, in Mark 13, 20, is it possible that could refer to just the last three and a half days of Daniel's 70th week rather than the entire week? Meaning the first half of the week would be a literal three and a half years of mankind's attempt at one-worldism, and the last half of the week is shortened 
of Re Revelation chapter 9 to 5 months. No, no, you can't do that. Why? Revelation chapter 17, Satan's time on earth is given as one hour. It's called the hour of temptation. So Revelation lets us know that that one hour is five months long. The entire hour is five months long. This is why it's written in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Well, how, if five months is one hour, how long is half an hour? Two and a half months. Why was there silence in heaven? Because they kicked him out. Okay. And Satan was on earth. All right. That's why there was silence there in heaven. There was finally peace. So it has, it, the whole bit comes to pass as it's written in completion. Richard, from that, uh, my references again, uh, Revelation chapter 17, one hour. 8, 1, half an hour in heaven, 9, chapter 9, five-month period. Richard from West Virginia. Question, some believe the church will be called away while Satan is here as the Antichrist, and they think the ones left here will be the ones that will be brought up before him to testify, and the Holy Spirit will speak through him. Is this a true statement? No, it is not. Absolutely not. Why? Because uh, the God, his church, is his election. And they've got work to do, and they will do it. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy God's word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. When you study the letter he sent to you, you make his day. Boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. You know why? Even with trouble. Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.
From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. There you got it right on the screen. Hour of temptation, the hour of temptation. We're going to talk on that subject. It is an hour, and you know what temptation is. So it is, if you would, that time allotted that people will be tempted.